So without further ado, let me introduce today's guest. Someone who pulls off short hair so much that she constantly makes us want to cut her own, my charisma and booty goals, the sexiest wake surfer I know, a Burning Man veteran, an avid traveler, an ayahuasca and huachuma drinker, a knife throwing, Harley riding, jujitsu queen and boxer, the on it first lady and former Miss USA, the host of Glory Kickboxing, a very vulnerable and honest woman that I'm so lucky to know. Please welcome Whitney Miller. Wow. What an intro, <laughs> you guys. Hi, hey, Whitney. Whitney. Yeah. Hey. We're so stoked to have pressure. you on. Huh? <laughs> oh, too much pressure. Um, <laughs> so wait, we were actually, before you jumped on the call, we were discussing jealousy. Um, and I know you and Aubrey are in an open relationship Jade and I both agree that jealousy is a learned emotion, but tell us how you have managed to reframe how you feel about jealousy and how you maintain your peace when it comes up again. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> jealousy is a good one because it's really something that we all experience. And honestly, for me, I was the most jealous girlfriend ever in my mm. past. Like, I was the one going through your phone and like you couldn't look at another person because why would you want to in all <laughs> of um but I was also like fairly unhappy because I was doing shit behind their back too like I wasn't being honest and I wasn't being authentic to how I actually felt mm -hmm. I just didn't want them doing it mm -hmm. um so there was definitely a disconnect there and so I think it's just you know going through a whole kind of the journey of an open relationship brings up all of your insecurities. Like it highlights every crack in the foundation. And when you feel something like jealousy come, come up, realizing that you don't have to, you don't have to go down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. of like just death, you know, cause it can take you so, so far and then realizing, okay, why am I jealous? Am I, am I afraid he's going to leave me? Do I have abandonment issues? Do I have self-worth issues? Do I have self-love issues? Like realizing that underneath jealousy, there's all of these other layers that you can dive into and get to know yourself a lot easier. And so when you, when you reframe it in your mind like that, oh, okay, what can this emotion teach me and why am I feeling this way? Mm -hmm. Instead of, oh, I'm just pissed and jealous because he's talking to another girl. Yeah. It's, you're learning more about yourself in that moment. Mm-hmm. I guess it's hard in a closed relationship if you feel like there is, you know, something shady going on, especially if you've been cheated on a lot in the past, to be able to do that and control that emotion because there's also like that fear of being hurt as well, you know? But, um, yeah, I, 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 I was, know. Go ahead. No, go. You're fine. I was wondering, so for me, I noticed that I get more jealous or like have the tendency to want to go through um, my husband's phone or my past lover's phone or whatever it is, you know, uh, during certain times of the month. So like hormonally, I can be triggered as far as my neediness goes. Um, I can be triggered as far as like whatever abandonment issues I have in the past getting brought up to the surface. It's like mm -hmm. it turns on certain times of the month. Do you find that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, I can tell when my period's about to come <laughs> I just, I know that coming, so it's already just a little more added pressure is yeah. basically what it is. So you do have to be aware of that. And, and that's something that I'll mention to Aub. I'm like, you know, I, I feel like my period's coming. I'm just feeling like, <laughs> emotional and this shit sucks, you yeah. know, but like, we're still, we've had so much practice that at least getting that out, mm -hmm. out in the forefront and being like, yes, okay. I am feeling this way because my hormones are a little bit, bit out of whack. So sorry if I'm being a Crazy. little more yeah. agitated or emotional or whatever, just like putting everything out there and setting the scene for it and then you can work yeah. through it so i think men aren't as um understanding of that in the beginning and then after a lot of well this is really true this experience, really experience yeah yeah then they're kind of like they know um, yeah yeah and i for me though it's when i've lacked sleep that's when mm -hmm. i'm super needy and emotional i don't it, hormones go into play for me but more than anything it's sleep and being a new mom that it's just a yeah, struggle. Yeah, you struggle. Going to no. happen. Um, I mean, your physical state dictates how you act in every part of the day, in your relationships, with friends, with lovers, with whatever it is. So yeah. I think also realizing being in the best place possible 
is going to help with the process. Yeah. yeah. So where you're at in your open relationship, how do you cultivate an environment where you do feel vulnerable and safe? It's a constant, I mean, it's a constant thing. First and foremost is communication because mm. everything has to be out on the table because everything between us is permitted. So if it's permitted, if there's any sort of like withhold or omission or shading of the truth or a little white light here, that becomes so much bigger mm-hmm. because it's not communicated in a 100% honest type of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think that your your other partners feel vulnerable and safe in the relationship or, or do they seem um, not as like comfortable with it at first? I think it's definitely a learning process. You know, um, I haven't had too many relationships that have been a long term type mm-hmm. of thing to where there's been that depth. Um, whereas Aubrey has, that's something that that's how his kind of relationships go. Um, recently I found somebody and now it's kind of like, we, we, we are getting to that point of being like, how are you feeling about this? You know, mm. at first he was like, absolutely not. I don't want to do it. And then he realized all the benefits and the positivity that can come from it and we talked about that. And so it's, once again, it's 100% open communication with everybody involved. That's the only way that it makes it smooth and the only way that it'll work. So mm. how do you introduce the other partners into this situation? Like, how does that, how do you bring it up? How does it start? Um, it just kind of like depends situation to situation. You know, we're so open. Yeah. We're so open relationship, but it, most people already know. But if I meet somebody, then it's like, hey, just so you know, I, I am engaged, but we're in an open relationship, and I'm allowed to like explore the people and enjoy and express and and whatever else. And so, do you, it's just laying it out there. Do you find that yeah. people are often like uncomfortable with that, or they just won't go there, or how do they? You know, like I, I'm just trying to. I, this is so interesting to me because it's just like. I am for me, it's like when men told me that I thought they were lying to me and just wanted to yeah. cheat on their partner, you know, but with y'all, it's different <laughs> yeah. because y'all are, y'all are open about that to the mm-hmm. public. So it's like, they have we the, know. the evidence, but with right. me, I was always like, you're, you're just, lying. Yeah. yeah. You just want to Usually cheat. it's like, Oh, you know, don't ask. It's a don't ask, don't tell policy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. So your wife has no idea what you're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Until she goes to your phone and catches right. you. And then it's like <laughs> that thing. Whereas with us, it's, it is very, very open. And most of the time, actually every single time we've been with somebody else, it's Aubrey meets them or I meet them or, yeah. you know, some of my best friends, the first girl that Aubrey started seeing when we started to do this open relationship is now my best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people think that's just so crazy, but it's like, we went through all of the shit. We had to have those hard conversations that you yeah. don't want to have. We had to be vulnerable. We had to be open. We saw each other at our worst and saw each other at our best. And so it's like, of course we're going to be friends now. You yeah. know? And they don't, I guess they do. They went through a period of not seeing each other and now they see each other again. And so it's kind of been like an ebb and flow of the relationship. And mm-hmm. As me and her are so close, it actually helps things along. It makes it more fluid and, and smooth. Super interesting. I guess one of the reasons why it's so mind boggling to me is because it's something that I never feel like I'm able to do. And it's not even about, je- I don't know if it's jealousy or if it's ego or um, I don't know. So it is really mind boggling to me. And I know um, something I talked to Kyle about is I was like, and I don't know if this is something y'all do regularly, but I notice people that microdose on LSD regularly are more into the open relationships. And I know that it came out in the seventies, um, that big, the big, um, like open relationship and free love, all that freedom came out in the seventies when people were doing LSD a lot. So I was wondering if it changes something in your brain that makes you a little, you know, less more egotistical, I, like, yeah, it helps you set aside your, your inner being from the ego, something of this. Yeah, nature. for sure. Sure. You know, I don't really microdose LSD all that often. I've only done it a few times and every time I've done it, it's been great. Um, for us, and I, I think for both of us, it's the fact of just psychedelic medicine in general allows you to look at your shit and it does show you, you know, this is your ego and this is your ego being because, you know, it wants to be this big thing that controls your life and blah, blah, blah. And so it really does allow you to separate who, like, your higher self from your small self. 
Is and that so what if you want to be in your small self, then you're going to be triggered and you're going to be jealous and your ego is going to yell and be like, look at me. Yeah. And yeah. But if you're coming from it from your higher self, then it's like, oh, shit, all is love. Like your pleasure is my pleasure. If you're happy, that's that should make me happy. Like I should right. not be upset by somebody that I love smiling mm-hmm. or having a good time. Yeah. Or hugging somebody. At you the know? end of the day, <laughs> that's the important part is, you know, make sure yeah. you want is that- the other person to experience as much love as possible. Is yeah. That thinking what... about it. Sorry. Sorry. It keeps glitching a little bit. So I never know when I'm interrupting. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> sorry. It's okay. And it's, you know, one thing that we say is like, think about it as your best friend, right? If yeah. you're talking to one of your best friends and they're out and they met somebody and they had a really great time and blah, blah, blah. You, you're pumped for it. Like, great. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Are you going to see him again? What is it going to be like? You know, what do you think? But if that happens with our partner, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hell no, you're not. That's so true. And really, it's all love. Like, just yeah. allow that person to fully express and, and fully enjoy life. Right. Yeah. We rarely treat our partners like our best friends. And we're, a lot of us are so different with our partners than we are with any of our friends. Mm-hmm. They would describe us as a little bit different, you know. But um, so is plant medicine what, because I know in the beginning you weren't um, as well, like wanting to do the open relationship and then um you decided to was it plant medicine that caused that transition I mean I think it was multiple things that caused that transition really for me it was no I don't think it was plant medicine I think it's that's helped for Mm. sure that's been definitely like an aid for both of us but this is something that you know he wanted to do and we had read multiple books and we had talked about it on like a philosophical intellectual level and then he was ready to put it into practice and I was like nope not gonna do it we're done so we split up I moved out of the house and I went on, I, I first started what was supposed to be a month long trip, backpacking trip to Peru. And I did watch Huma there for the first time. Hmm. Um, and then I went on a, it turned into three months. So I took the furthest direct flight that I could get out of Lima. I landed in Madrid. I did Madrid and Barcelona. I went to Thailand and trained Muay Thai for a month. Um, met some really great people there, went to Bali with them. And so this whole kind of like finding myself, and it was the first time I've ever traveled by myself and realizing, and I had a connection with somebody there, but but I'm still very much so in love with Bob. And I was like, oh, wait, I can have a connection with somebody and enjoy somebody, but still fully love somebody else just because Mm. that's like, takes my love away from Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I got home, he was like, I still really want to be with you. And I was like, great. I still really want to be with you, but we're going to do it under this kind of new open relationship container. And that's kind of how it started. Mm. Yeah. That's so crazy. It's so cool that you share this story with, you know, you're so open with it because I think it's something people of course think about when they're in relationships, it's very natural for humans to wonder, right? Especially if their needs aren't met. Sure. And, um, I guess it leads me to also the question or maybe just you can give a rundown on how you practice like being safe um, as far as like STDs and that type of thing go in an open relationship. Because I think people who are interested or intrigued on on the whole open relationship thing, it's important to know. Sure. And I think that's what that to me is actually really funny that people go to that. What about STDs? It's like, (laughs) what? I am way safer now Mm -hmm. than I've been ever in my entire life because it's you're for us it's everybody has to get tested and you have to show your papers when do you ever do that when you're single and you're gonna hook up with somebody (laughs) yeah you know like I don't I mean I've definitely gotten tested I've had somebody else get tested but I've never been like okay great I think it would be awesome for us to hook up however I need you to get it tested and you need to show me your papers otherwise we're 1000% using a condom and there's no other way that it's going to go. Otherwise we're just not going to have sex, you know? Yeah. And so for me, it's, we're just, that's how it is. It's very safe. It's open. Papers are shown. Everybody knows the deal. And that's that. Is there any, I guess, I don't know, for me, I'd be like nervous about the people that you're in other outside relationships with who also, you know, are open to being with other people as well. Like anything becoming, I mean, I guess anything's possible in any relationship ever. Mm -hmm. So there's risks you run, but yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, there's always a risk, but 
that's also the thing is you have to trust yourself and, mm-hmm. and, and trust the other person and, and really know that if you're getting into some sort of sexual relationship with somebody, you should be able to trust them. Yeah. You know, yeah. of course, there's always something that could come up, but um, you should be able to trust that person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for us, it's like, okay, if you are with somebody else and you don't use protection and you have to get tested yeah. before we're together. Mm-hmm. Good you know. Yeah. Um, so if Ab one day came to you and it was like, I want to, you know, our, I want to close our relationship. I want to become closed. Is that something that at this point you would want to do? Or are you enjoying this the way it is? No, I'm totally enjoying it. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have like the man that I love so, so much and I still get to go and explore and have fun and get those butterflies that maybe aren't here in a seven year relationship. And, and yeah. you know, it's just different layers and levels of a relationship that if you're monogamous, you don't get to fully experience. I don't, I don't have to wonder about it. I get to experience it on my own. Yeah. But the other thing is, is, you know, the container, the boundaries and the agreements and the container of the relationship is malleable. Yeah. It can change. It's fluid. It, mm. it, just because we're open today doesn't mean we're going to be open 100% the same way for the rest right. of our life. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, great. If we're open now and it's working for us and that feels good, let's do that. Now down the road, if one thing that comes up, if I, when I get pregnant, how are my yeah. emotions going to be? How are yeah. my hormones going to yeah. be? Am I you know, I'm going to feel kind of awkward in my body? Is that a moment or a time period to where we close the relationship for a little while? You know, so it's it's really just figuring out what works best for us in the moment and and dictating and kind of changing our agreements to fit that. Yeah, yeah. that I didn't even think about the pregnancy that thing. Sense. That would yeah. definitely I think that things. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I didn't think about that either. I did think about like, well, you know, once you have kids, it's like it's probably a lot harder to like dedicate time to family and, you know, outside as well. But. That's a good point. Um, Before you go on, Jade, um, uh I was going to ask about the, so being in a, in a really solid relationship with Aubrey for all these years now is having outside relationships, something that brings up like a freshness over and over again, or like, is it this competitive nature that comes out or what is the things that kind of relights the fire over and over that comes from having an open relationship? Yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of the fact that you can't really get complacent in your relationship, you Mm -hmm. know, because you want to keep the spark there and the spark stays because you get to experience other people and and have fun doing that. Yeah. But then Mm -hmm. at the same time, you get to come home and you're like, yay, here I am at home and I'm back. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's like if you go on a trip for a while, you're excited to come home. But if you're Mm -hmm. living in the same house constantly and working together and sleeping together and doing everything at some point you're like, man, can you just leave me alone for a minute? <laughs> you know, I think that's just kind of like human nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. I would think also it would almost make less conflict in a way because you're kind of getting your like energy out, you know what I mean? Like in other ways than just like, all focused on one person almost too. Sure. I mean, definitely not less conflict. I oh, mean, okay. <laughs> this has been one hell of a ride and it's yeah. constantly bringing us because it brings up your core shit. Yeah. Like you hide, you can't strap yourself, which is something we've recently been talking about. It's like it, always it brings something up for you. So you have to go in and look at it. Whereas mm. if you're in a monogamous relationship, not all monogamous relationships by any means, but if you're in some sort of relationship to where you can kind of like, oh, you know what? We just don't really need to talk about that. Or we don't need to go down that road. We don't need mm-hmm. to do this. You know, so it's still going to have its own um, challenges. But I mean, open is hard as hell. For, yeah. And I, it's not even something that I recommend for everybody by any means. I think some people should be monogamous and some people should be an open. But be aware of how difficult it actually is. Mm-hmm getting into an open relationship, but also aware that it can be incredibly freeing. Mm. So um, I'm doing my 10th plant plant medicine ceremony uh, in three weeks. And I know that looking back, it's hard to choose just one that like stands out and, you know, 
influenced you the most because they're also transformational. But if you had to choose just one to share with us and our listeners, what would it be? Um, for me, it would, I, Wachuma for me is a huge heart opener, huh? Yeah. A huge heart opener. And it's the like grandfather wisdom. And so yeah. I, you know, had my headphones on one day and I listened to this song as I was going out, you, you go out on the Amazon and it's kind of like about a 12 to 14 hour trip. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to one song and when we came back that same night, you know, eight hours later or whatever, I heard the same song again. And I, I remember saying to myself, oh, I remember when you used to listen to that song when you were a little girl. And this was mm-hmm. referring to myself before. eight hours before. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it was living, a, and they say you live a lifetime in a single day. And that's exactly what happened. And it was just like, it takes your fear away. It took my fear away and it just exploded my heart. And that like one moment always sticks out to me. And one, another one that's huge for actually Aubrey and I, we were going through a really difficult time. I think we were, I think we were actually split up and we were in Peru together with a big group and we were at a beach on the second Wachuma day and we were both under the medicine and we, it was basically a realization of like, oh my God, like this, what are, what are we doing? You know, like this, we have, we're, we've built up so much of our resentments and our, our armor and things that scared us and all of these things of why we couldn't do this and wanted to push each other away. And then that relaxed all of that because you just, you're not even really able to live in, in those lower, you know, vibrations yeah. when you're on plant medicine like that. So it allowed us to see each other with completely fresh eyes and like, com- like totally revamp our relationship. Wow. Mm. I I've love never, that. Yeah, I've never done it before, but I'm very intrigued. Um, how would you say plant medicine has, has benefited your life most? And what would you say to those like me who are intrigued, but haven't got to the point yet of trying it yet? Well, for you guys, it's, you know, when you're fully called to do it, go, like that's when you should do it. Mm-hmm. Like don't mm-hmm. let anyone else, draw you into it because you really won't be able to relax into the experience and you won't get what Mm -hmm. what was meant for you Mm -hmm. you know sometimes do psychedelics like ayahuasca and wachuma and they don't have a single vision Mm. you know so it's really when you're ready to go and when you're ready to release and surrender and just have no expectations and let the medicine take you that's the best time to go yeah um and i think that kind of goes for anything but um for me it's been it's been really helpful. Before I met Aubrey, I was, I was basically like a steel trap. Like nobody could penetrate my anything. I was just, (laughs) I hadn't cried in like five years or something. It was, what made you that way? I think it was, you know, for me, it was, I grew up, um, being told like crime's not going to do anything for you. Why are you crying? Mm. I was like, you're kind of right. Crying isn't helping the situation at all. So I'm just not going to cry and I'm going to do everything that I should do. And no one can hurt me and no one can do this and that, you know, I was just like, so, so like armored from my, you know, childhood. And I think it mainly was, you know, me and my dad are super close now, but it was like growing up with a single father. He raised me from the time I was four or when I was in fourth grade up through high school and college. And he was, you know, single father, very hardworking. Um, But there are multiple women that kept coming into my life and trying to dictate how I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to do. And so I was like, hell no, I'm not going to do that. So I wouldn't listen to anybody. It was really difficult for me to have relationships with females because I didn't trust any of them. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was just a steel trap, Mm -hmm. basically. Um, And then I was in a really bad relationship in college and that just enforced it you know and so when I met Aubrey it was I I am a 1000 percent completely different person today than I was you know seven years ago um, Mm -hmm. when I met him and I think the first thing is we did a cleanse together and that was the first kind of like opening of this whole new world and then we did psychedelics and it's, it's giving me the opportunity to shed that armor and shed those fears and see where the fears come from. And, and it's just been so freeing. Mm-hmm. What kind of cleanse did you do to start out? We did 
and liver and gallbladder cleanse. Mm. So it's just juice and smoothies for, I think it was seven days in Sedona, but it was also paired with um, ecstatic dance and holotropic breathing and body work. And it was like beyond powerful. And yeah. stuff you had I, never experienced before that, right? I, yeah, I was like, sweet, I'm going to go and <laughs> drink some juice and lose some pounds. I know, That's yeah. <laughs> Yay. And then it was just this whole like mind blowing transformational experience that I couldn't even, to this day, it's one of my most transformational experiences that I've had yeah. in my entire life. It, um, even including psychedelics. Yeah, I love yeah. that you that that's uh, you know something you got to do that was just you. It wasn't necessarily you know having a, a plant medicine or something that mm-hmm. kind of forces that awakening. It was you finding um, a little piece of yourself you lost. Right, I think it's and that's funny. The thing. You can um, you can still reach these higher realms and these yeah. higher vibrations mm-hmm. without you know taking an external substance. Mm-hmm. There's so mm-hmm. much that you do with just your breath with dance, with meditation, with yoga, with, with nothing else other than you and yourself. Yeah. I think it's funny how, um, close you feel to your partner when you do a cleanse together. Like, uh, it's always, I feel like to me, there's always a lot more humor added to the relationship. Maybe, I don't know, uh, if it's because you're a little bit more present cause there's no other like distractions and substances. And then, um, you're being cleansed out. Um, so yeah, I, you're like cooing right next yeah. to each other. So there's like <laughs> yeah. all that humor. So I love that. Um, and then I love ecstatic dance because sometimes for me, it's like a miniature ceremony without any medicine. You know, it's very freeing. But I actually, when I do Huachuma, it's at a ecstatic dance. So we're like, it's together and it is, it's always so aligning. Um, I don't know if you see this uh, picture right there at the very top of that woman with like her heart going into oh, her yeah. throat. yeah. Yeah, the first time, I love it. Yeah, the first time I did Huachuma um, during a dance ceremony, um, my neck, like my neck was all the way back. Like I was I was thinking like, oh my God, everyone's going to come over here and like <laughs> be worried about me because my it was like the back of my head was connected to my back. Like it was so far back, it was hurting and I couldn't pull it forward if I wanted to. And my, my heart was like on fire and it was my they were merging and I hadn't ha- seen that photo yet. So they were like merging and I was in, I don't know why in my, um, your throat I could and feel heart my th- or what the, yeah, the okay. chakras, but my throat I noticed first. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to be speaking my truth from now on. Like <laughs> thinking that I was getting this power. And then, uh, Huachuma was like real gentle, like laughing, like no. And then my heart <laughs> caught on fire and aligned and it was like, no, you're going to speak in love. Um, and that was really, uh, when it comes to Pachuma, that was, it just felt so aligning my, my chakras. And, um, then I like spent time with the moon and we were like dancing in the labyrinth and it was just, it was so beautiful. Um, and I have another one of those at the end of November. So I'm super exciting. Cause there's always, like you said, it's like grandfather wisdom. There's always something that I really, um, you know, it's not like a, it's a lot of homework, but there's always some like really strong wisdom dropped where I'm like, uh, okay, this is, this is where I need to change how I deal with this. Do you ever um, feel yeah. ready for it? Like going into no, the ceremony? No, I'm always <laughs> scared the day of. Like I said, it's my 10th one in a couple of weeks. And I'm and I, even a couple of days ago, I was like, oh, man, that's really soon. Like, What about you, Lizzie? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I always get butterflies yeah. for, before every ceremony. <laughs> even I like a static so. dance. You know, sometimes I still have resistance to doing something like that. Yeah. Even though it's just dancing around not worrying about anything else because it is like a ceremony is yeah. going to bring up your shit. You got to be, vul- you're coming into a vulnerability. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. I've only had one dark ceremony. Um, and it did take me like a couple months to get over. Um, yeah. I couldn't be alone for a couple days. It was really, really dark. But even now when I look back, I'm not going to say I'm glad it happened because it was so hard, but I at least got something from it. Like I at least had a takeaway, you, you know, survived it too, which is something. Yeah. Um, so what is your biggest struggle currently and how are you using that to grow? Well, for me, it's, you know, I'm transitioning and I actually talked to Paul Selig about this is, Mm -hmm. and and what he told me is I'm in this transition from a girl to the capital W woman. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what I've been trying to do. And so you really using my voice because for me, like we talked about a little bit earlier, I'm good at distraction. 
So I can mm-hmm. be like, oh, there's that, but I'm going to go over here because this is so much better, you know, mm-hmm. and I can just distract, distract, distract. Um, so it's like really speaking my voice, like you were saying, and, and speaking it honestly and not being afraid of, of who's going to think about it or what they're going to think in like fully embodying that and and moving into capital W woman and being yeah. that. What was his uh, like nugget of truth for you when you talked to him about that? Um, so we all asked about one question and I, mm. I basically asked him is, you know, is there anything that's keeping me from living my truth? And, um, he, basically he was just like, you're in this transition period to where it is kind of uncomfortable coming into this womanhood and mm-hmm. how big it can be, but you kind of like it mm. and it's, it's kind of fun for you. But it, he also said it was funny. He's like, it's almost like you're going to walk you see yourself and you have like the best outfit and you walk into a party and then you slide and slip on your ass. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how I've been feeling recently. Like I felt like I had all of this truth and I was like living my truth and I was speaking my truth and I had, you know, things figured out and then it'd be like crash and burn. You don't know shit. And then yeah. I'd be like, okay, we can maybe try to do it again. It's like crash and burn. You don't know anything. And so I feel like that's it, just the cycle of life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's also, particularly for me, not judging myself when I do fall yeah. and when I do fail or when I do hurt people. Cause I have a strong inner critic that will just like beat me up for mm-hmm. any little thing that I've done wrong. And then I'm not moving past it. I'm not healing it. I'm just constantly stuck there being like, well, you suck and you should have known better and you're stupid and blah, 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 blah. So for me, that's actually probably my biggest struggle at this current moment is not seeing myself as much and, and having heal and move on. Yeah. How, so you've, you're learning to like quiet that self. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we had Heather Ashamara on, she wrote a book with Don Miguel Ruiz that's coming out, um, at the end of this month. So she, um, two things I love about her is, uh, she's taught me to just say like, oops, you know, like, when I mess up instead of beating myself up. Um, but one thing that I really did learn from her a lot is, is speaking your truth. She says, if you look at any of the conflict in your life or any resentment you have, it probably started from you not speaking your truth. And that's really, that really hit home for me. So that helps me to, you know, use my voice like you were saying. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to note for list, anyone listening since you brought up Paul Selig, he's someone who we also interviewed on um, this podcast who channels spirit guides and is a medium for the living. So your experience there is super interesting. You guys can go back yeah, and listen. Yeah, and again. if you don't know, just go click on that yeah. episode. <laughs> You'll find yeah. out all you need to know about Paul in that episode. <laughs> Um, so you obviously have to have confidence and vulnerability in order to do all the things that we've talked about this far. Um, how do you go about cultivating those two things in yourself? How do I go about cultivating confidence? Sorry, you cut out a little, uh, confidence and vulnerability. How do you go about cultivating those two things in yourself? You know, for me, vulnerability has always been kind of difficult, um, but it's as soon as I feel some sort of like constriction in my heart or like there's some sort of fear that's keeping me from doing it, that's, I use that as like an arrow being like, mm, that's exactly where you need to go with it. Mm-hmm. If you're afraid of mentioning this to somebody, then you need to go like it. You know, you don't have to do it right now or now is not the best time. And I think, you know, through this relationship, it's also helped with that. It's, there's not a better time other than right now. Like if it's on your mind, you need to discuss it now and just using that. And then confidence comes from the proof that you can do that. So when you're constantly showing yourself over and over and over again, okay, I got it. I can do it. I can push through the fear. Then your confidence ultimately rises anyway. It's like Mm. you're creating competence over confidence in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I like what you say about, um, the vulnerability, like what I, I like to, I, I've 
been quoted on this podcast now several times saying seek the pain for positive gain or positive change so basically going into those hard places those painful places and knowing you're going to have to go through some shit but it's you know on the other side is going to be that bluer sky that better Mm -hmm. better life absolutely no doubt love it so um we talked a little bit about your traveling the world on your own and Mm -hmm. going off for months at a time. Tell me a good story, like a story you really just comes to mind. doesn't have to be, you know, necessarily all positive, but just a great story you have from your travels alone as a young, beautiful woman on the road. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, One that comes to mind was I was in, man, there's so many, but I was in Costa Rica and I really like to stay in youth hostels when I travel by myself, which mm. people think it's like crazy because I love my, you know, extensive things and I love a nice hotel room and sweet and <laughs> and bad. Yeah. But it's like, okay, I'm gonna stay in a ten dollar night youth hostel because that's what I do. And you know, I've been doing this all the time and I think when I do that, I get to meet so many like minded people and so many people I would have never entered in conversation with, I would have never crossed paths with at all and it's just so fun to be able to do that so I was in Costa Rica and I was going to Nicaragua and me being me I was like you know I'm going to walk across the border (laughs) instead of fly there or get a car or something because it was I don't because I was I knew I was going to have some sort of story and so I go and people are like you for sure shouldn't do that (laughs) not it's like it's not really that safe going yeah it'll be fine whatever and so I go and it's just it's mayhem at this border and people are like you're like grabbing your bags and like trying to take there's machine guns everywhere and you go and like you get your you have your passport and people it's in this like cement block where the walls are blown out and it's like just a small desk and there's like chickens it's just mayhem and to get through the get through the um, other side of the border you have to like go through a chain linked fence that's just like cut out okay. but it was just like that's to me I was like I cannot believe that I did that it was such a bad idea but a memory that lasts forever so I'm glad that I did it um, and then another one you know for me, traveling by myself is such good medicine, Mm -hmm. like huge medicine. Um, And back in Costa Rica, because I like to surf. So anywhere I go, I want, I usually like people to speak Spanish so I can practice that and I can surf. And I just recently, a few months ago, went by myself. Um, I didn't stay in a youth hostel this time, but I didn't take my phone. And Mm. I was there for one week and just completely disconnected and any, you know, sat with my thoughts for a full week, surfed, and when I came home, I was just, like, beaming and so free and so fresh and just, like, so inspired to get back home and get back to work and, and you know, share the lessons that I learned. And it's just, it's huge medicine. Yeah, mm. entirely. I love that. I've, I've backpacked 25 countries on my own, staying in hostels. Some of them didn't even have running water. Um mm-hmm. And then I've, I've done a couple with my partner, but definitely when I backpacked Southeast Asia by myself, it was the happiest I have ever been in my entire life. Like I, it, it was such medicine. And a couple months prior to that, I was actually so down on life that I didn't want to live anymore. Just like <sighs> five months prior. Um, um, is that? Adam. <laughs> um, oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, God, um, so yeah. God, is that you? God, sneezing. God bless you. Yeah. So, um, just like five months prior to, um, to being in Pai, Thailand, I was literally at the point of contemplating suicide. And then in, in Pai, I had never felt such peace and happiness. And so I had a little monk tattoo the word, a smile on my back and tie writing oh. inside a temple and bless it. Cause it was just a reminder that a smile is always around the corner, you know, like had I given up, I wouldn't have experienced this. Um, and then there's a lot of, I have a lot of stories in Africa too, that like yours, where I was like, I can't believe I fucking did that. Like, I can't believe I got on that motorcycle with that stranger. Like I could have died. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. So I love, 
I love that story. The both of those stories that you shared. I don't have anything as gnarly. I mean, I went to Petra last year and like we drove through the Jordanian desert for seven hours to get there and stayed in like a little tent camp out in the desert but it was with my husband so I wasn't really you know it wasn't like alone with strangers <laughs> I feel like um, there's this there. one story that I remember now that I was um at a house I was there with my ex-boyfriend at the time this was years ago and we were at this beautiful house that was overlooking this cove and it was all glass and it was just epic and we had like a whole group, but I wasn't feeling well. And so they all went out and I stayed at the house. And all of a sudden the alarm goes off. And this alarm is like a bank alarm. It is so loud and I'm just freaking out. Like, I don't know what's about to happen. I'm trying to call the guy, whoever owns the house and they're all out at the bar and he's not answering. And I'm like, I'm about to die. Like I, it's all over from here. So then I go into the bathroom and I get my like like my makeup brushes and I put them in between my fingers just in case somebody has to come in there and I was oh going to fucking kill them with my makeup brushes oh and my I just God. had all of these ideas of what was going to happen and finally the guy that answers and they get back to the house and, and they're like looking around they don't see anything they watch the cameras and it was a monkey that set oh. the alarm off. Oh my god! And I'm like falling, crying. Like, you don't understand. Oh my god! <laughs> At least you knew the alarm worked. I, I guess. was about to kill a monkey yeah. with my makeup brush. Yeah. yeah. So I am um, on all these travels. Have you met any psychos though, or like attracted any weird stuff that came back with you? No, I don't think so. I don't think I've met any like super weirdos. I've met some really dope people who I'm still great friends with. Actually, like you know, I met an Australian girl and her boyfriend in Thailand, and I went to Bali with them. And now we and they live in Australia, but now we see each other every two years. They come to Austin. They just left Austin, and um, I, I meet some of the most interesting people. It's so cool. Yeah. One time um, I abseiled down the Sippy Falls in Uganda. There are like three waterfalls right next to each other. And when I got to the bottom, I camped at the bottom, not thinking that anything bad could happen. It was like in the jungle, but I knew there were like witch doctors that people were afraid of. But I just, I don't know. I just didn't yeah. think anything what bad, bad could happen. What bad could happen in the Ugandan jungle? Yeah. So it was just yeah. me, me, a book. And this was before iPhones. Like this was like. Maybe there were iPhones, but I couldn't afford one at the time. So I had no, like, internet signal. I just had – well, I wouldn't have anyways. But I just had me, a book, and a lantern inside this tent. And I remember after the sun going down, just hearing these weird noises around my tent. And just, like, kind of just trying to be into my book and not get worried. Well, then they were getting louder and louder as the sun got darker. And I realized they were hyenas, like, just circling my tent. And I was so terrified that this is still so silly, but I was so terrified that I wrote letters to my family to say goodbye. <laughs> oh my God. I wrote a letter to my mom and my sister. And I think my, like the guy I liked at the time and oh, to my birth dad and my cousin. Soul searching. Uh, I still have those letters actually. <laughs> wow. You should send them wow. with like a preface. This is when I thought I was going to die in this tent in Uganda. I thought in the hyenas were going to eat yeah. me. I'll give this to you anyhow. I survived. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that would have yeah. freaked me out. Yeah, I feel like I just would have gone. I would just gone crazy, like ah! yeah, like hitting the tent and stuff. I don't know. I don't know if Getting that's a good or bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to stay. I tried to stay. Luckily, I didn't have any food with me for them to smell. Smell, but I tried to stay as quiet as possible. Um, and, and also, then, what is abseiling? Is that what you called it? Abseiling is when there's a, a rope attached to um, the very top, and you're like going down the rope. Oh, okay. Like it's a huge long rope and you're just going down, Find but down. right next to the waterfall to where you're like, what? From yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Amazing. Wow, very cool. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Was there other people uh, there? Uh, there was no one else there besides the one guy that like connects your rope to the thing. Okay. Just the, and then he, just... his name was, his name was Moses and he carried a long stick. <laughs> and I remember before we were going to ask him. Yes, he did. I know. <laughs> is this in the before book of we, Is this in the book of Jade? I know. Yeah, I know. Well, before we were gonna abseil, because I was so lost and I knew what I wanted to do, but I couldn't figure it out. And he was like, "Come with me." And he was just walking with the stick, and I was like, "Oh, I hope this is a good idea." And then he tied tied me to that thing, and I abseiled down. It was great. Besides the near death. Wow. Feelings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eaten by hyenas. Yeah. And I feel better um, about I feel better about Whitney traveling because I know you're. You practice MMA for a long time, right? 
So at uh-huh. least you traveling alone. But Jade, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Not gonna lie. For me, I'm like, where's my pen and paper? Yeah. I've got notes to write. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. All right. So there's a few questions we like to ask everyone who comes on the show. First off, what advice would you give to your 25 year old self? Um, probably same lesson that I'm learning today is just to be more vulnerable and not take anything too seriously. Stop judging yourself so much. Mm. Like, Every this whole process is is beautiful, right? So every challenge that comes up, or any, um, if you hurt somebody, if they hurt you, it's just don't judge the situation and just realize that there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's so much that can be learned. See it as a gift and not as a curse. Something I like yeah. to remind myself too is like, in five years, will this matter? You know, or on my deathbed, is this something I'll even give two seconds to? Which is yeah, the light on your deathbed. Snow. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, if you could have the whole world read one book, which would it be? Ooh. Oh, my God. Well, I actually just finished reading my favorite two books. That, and they're by um, Ted Decker, who's a really good friend of ours. The first one's called The 49th Mystic, and the second one's mm. actually right here in front of me. He, <gasps> Rise of the Mystics. Ooh. I have that in my um, cart on Amazon because Kyle told me about it. It's amazing yeah it's big I didn't realize it was that thick <laughs> yeah this one's have you read the 49th the 49th is the first book so you got to read that first and then yeah this, is, this one comes out in October oh it is October is it out it's not out I yet. think it's available for pre-order maybe because I think I have both of them named cart on Amazon maybe it's like not ready to ship or whatever it's so good really is this That's the same amazing. person who wrote the 48 laws of or what is it no oh, okay no Ted Decker is actually like a Christian author. Okay. Um, but he takes like such a beautiful, how would you explain? I don't even know how to explain it, but he just takes like such a beautiful stance on, I don't know, just read it. You'll love it. (laughs) Story that you get sucked into and you're like on this journey of self-realization and challenge and, being able to fully understand like the upper worlds and the high vibrations and how everything mm. is connected, but it's also this like thrilling story. So you're sucked in the whole time. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. So many beautiful like nuggets in there. Like I, I've highlighted so much of this book and taken so many notes and it, I feel like it's really helped me along this journey with like a transformation. Cause I can see a lot of myself in the main character and I feel like mm. that's, that's how a lot of people can relate to it. Yeah. That's cool. Like, That's so different from what everyone else has said. So I like that answer. I was going to say, yeah. I feel like See, whenever... for me, I like, Sorry, I really like conscious reading mm-hmm. and like having the, I, I love all of like the mastery of love and, you know, like you're saying the 48, 49, 48 levels of power. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. Um, those books are amazing and great and I've gained so much for them. Uh, but for me, having a story behind it allows me to play along and and bring it more into my life yeah yeah it's easier to integrate sometimes when it's a story Mm -hmm. because I I was talking about this last night with Chris that every time I read an amazing book I'm like oh my god this is changing my life you know I send it to all my friends it's groundbreaking and then integrating it into my life and and you know using it as my practice that's the part that's hard and you try to read it over and over again and you sometimes just like Eh, you get on to the next thing, yeah. on to the next thing. So that's the hardest thing for me is like figuring out how to integrate these amazing new tools that I'm learning into my mm-hmm. actual exactly. life. Yeah. Have you? The other one I like is the Celestine Prophecy. It's another oh. really great. Oh, I, I have heard, heard of that one. one. I haven't heard of that one. It's so good, Jade. You would love it. Um, it's a story. And it, I mean, it's along the lines of everything we're talking about here. But uh, I I got the movie. No, it's terrible. <laughs> What? I didn't even know there was. Yeah, exactly. That's because it never made any noise. That's almost always the the case. Um, but the book have you is and dope. Yeah. Aubrey read together um, "Getting the Love That You Want." Um, that is my favorite relationship book. It's got like some imago exercises in it. It's pretty intense. Like if any couple can do it, it'd be like y'all or 
uh, like Kyle and Natasha, like yeah. we, me and my partner got to exercise three and he was like, I'm done. Like, <laughs> is it so, so let me give you just an example of the exercises. This is in the Please. back of the book after you read it. So it really preps you for them. But the agreement is there's 12 exercises. You're supposed to do one a week and like be loyal to it. So the first one, um, is you write out like all the qualities of your mother and father that stood out to you and you circle the ones that influence you the most. So the next week you do the same thing with your partner and you uh, answer this guide that you're like, oh, I see how I kind of chose people that have some similarities. Well, the third time, and this is where most people probably quit, you sit Indian style in front of your partner and you stare in their eyes, which is already a little difficult for some people, you know? So Mm -hmm. what the book teaches is that your subconscious cannot differentiate between yesterday and today. It can't differentiate between your primary caregiver and your lover. So when you receive healing from your lover, it heals parts of you from your childhood. So that's why we seek out certain characteristics. So what the book has you do is you stare in the eyes of your partner and you say, I'm seven years old. You're always threatening to commit suicide. You're my mother. You're always threatening to commit suicide and you're blaming me. You're always screaming at me. You uh, beat me till I bleed. It makes me feel worthless. It makes me feel like I shouldn't be alive. Like you just put it all out there talking to your partner as if they're your mother or father. Mm -hmm. So then your partner says, I'm your mother. I beat you till you're black and blue. I blame you for my suicidal tendencies. And then at the very, after repeating everything and validating you, they say that they're sorry. Wow. So, and then you take turns and your partner goes, um, and it's just, I have goosebumps all over my body talking about it because it's so, may not sound intense, but when you do it, it's so much more. sure sounds intense. But so much more comes out than what you plan. Like yeah. you think in your head, like, oh, I was hurt here, here, and here. Once you're actually talking to your partner as if they're your parent, so many more emotional trauma comes out. And you're kind of, for the next three days, kind of a little bit on edge because you dug it all up, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to see what you thought about that book. Yeah, as a, that sounds wild. Wow. We'll give it a go. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, um, I like that you articulated that very well, Jade. I feel like I have to go buy this book now, but I'm afraid to do the work. Um, (laughs) So one more question. Uh, If you could whisper one phrase to everyone on the planet, what would it be? I love you. I love you. Oh, that's sweet. I like that. That's simple and sweet. Yeah. Um, So we do have um, from our magic mob, which is our tribe of listeners, we do have two questions that they came up with for you. One was, you seem so calm-tempered. Is there anyone you've met since you and Ab do so many cool interviews and experiences that has caused you to feel starstruck? Sorry, you cut out. I didn't oh, just you did too. Okay. Yeah, I repeated it. So, uh, you seem so calm-tempered. Is there anyone you've met since sorry, you and Ab? Sorry, Jade. Will you uh-huh. just repeat from... Like yeah. introduce it from the magic so, mob. So we have two questions from the magic mob, which are our tribe of listeners. Um, they wanted to ask you, you seem so calm tempered. Is there anyone you've met since you and Ab do so many cool interviews and experiences that has caused you to feel any sort of like starstruck at all? Um, That's a good hmm. question. That is a good question. I feel like I was starstruck kind of recently, but somebody that was, oh, you know who it was? It was um, in Q. He's, mm, the, he's on my, he's on my, it's like right here. His name is right here on, on your, my dream yeah. guest list for the show. <laughs> <laughs> I used to listen to so much of his stuff. And then I met him and was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it is in Q. Uh, and now we're like, and now we're like friends with him and like, you know, he, he's done a lot of events with Aubrey and stuff and he's, he's amazing. But mm-hmm. I would say I got kind of starstruck with that for sure. Yeah. Also, I- if I read into Conor McGregor, I would get starstruck. Uh, oh God. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. so the other question they had for you was being a previous Miss USA, what is your current view on the pageant industry? You know, at my, at, kind of where I'm at now is I'm so far removed from the pageant industry and it was kind of for me pageants was something that I just wanted to do and wanted to try so I w- it wasn't something that I'd done my entire life and I wasn't fully 
um, into it. So, but for me, I think it's, you know, I, I think pageants do have some sort of a negative connotation surrounding them, but it can also be incredibly positive mm-hmm. with help gain confidence, even though being judged in bikinis and whatever, but it really helps with public speaking, yeah. um, gain confidence. You meet a lot of really cool girls. And so I don't, I don't have any sort of like negative thing to say about the pageant industry. I love how the girls are becoming more fit. I think yeah. that's amazing. I love seeing the girls and they have, you know, some abs and their arms look great. So instead of the tall, skinny, super model yeah. type of, they, they're looking for people who are out there and taking care of their body and are being healthy. And um, that makes me really happy to see. Yeah. I love love how they're starting to take a stand too. Um, I was Miss San Antonio. I didn't go on to Miss Texas because I went through a divorce that year and all types of crazy stuff. But um, uh, my favorite part was having a platform. And uh, one night, Valentine's Day night, this is still one of my favorite nights in life. Um, I they had me go be a guest at the Sweethearts Ball for adults with Down syndrome. And uh, this woman was probably in her thirties and she asked if she could wear my crown and sash. And so I was like, yeah, sure. So I put it on her and like half an hour later, her parents came back with like roses for her and, and, um, they were crying and I was like, Hmm, like, cause I just let her wear my crown and sash. And they were like, you don't understand. Like she really believes that she's a pageant queen tonight. And this has been one of her like dream come true is to like be a, a beauty, a beauty queen. So, um, it was really cute. And when I, I went over to her and I was like, can I take a picture with you? And she's like, oh, yes, you may. And it was just, it was so oh. sweet. Like she really, That's you know, so I know adorable. I loved it. So it's more the experiences that you get. Um, I think the platform and the experiences you get to like, um, you know, volunteer at certain things that I think are, are really cool about it too, that I think people don't realize come with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get to do a lot of really great, um, like you said, appearances and charity work. Yeah. It's fun. It's, it's yeah. certainly fun to do. Yeah. So we have a pick your poison question from the Magic Mom. These are always fun. The question is, would you rather speak seven languages or be able to talk to animals? Uh-oh. Oh, we lost her. Ryan Riyad. Uh, oh, are you there? I there's maybe you're back. I'm here mm-hmm. now. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, Can you hear Riyad? I don't have a video. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear anything. Oh, okay. I, I have video. I don't. Yeah. Let me see. I can see her. I don't have anything on my side yet. So well, make... since, she, since she can hear. I know, but my side's oh, screen you're recording. recording. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sorry, wait. Let's see what we can. This do. is the last question. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> okay. okay. Cool. <laughs> Still not pulling up for me. Jade, do you want to see if you can re-add her? Maybe. Um, I think it's okay because it's the last question. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, did you hear? You didn't hear the question. Right. What? No. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So we have a question from the Magic Mob. Um, let me say that again. We have a pick your poison question from the Magic Mob. These are always fun. So the question is, would you rather speak seven languages or be able to speak to animals? Shoot. If you can hear us, what we can't hear you. Oh, there she is. Uh, I can't hear you guys. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> okay. Okay. The question okay, one more is, time with me. Uh, let's see. We have a question. Uh, pick your poison question from the magic mob. These are always fun. So the question is, would you rather speak seven languages or be able to speak to animals? Speak seven languages. Oh, really? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I already speak to my dog all the time, guys. <laughs> so if I can uh, speak seven languages, then I can speak to all kinds of animals already. <laughs> it is super sexy. Yeah, no, I think it would be dope. I, I would love to be able to speak seven. For Glory, all of these spiders oh, yeah. speak at least three to four different languages. And we're sitting there like, well, I only speak one. 
you know? <laughs> and so I think it would be amazing to do that. I know it's embarrassing when you go sure. to other countries. They they speak like at least four almost everywhere else. But I know here. it is like yeah, mostly in America that we just are lazy, lazy. with it. Lazy. Um, individuals. It sounds super sexy to be able to speak seven. Um, and definitely easier to travel, but I just got a dog last week and I've never wanted to be able to speak to an animal more. So in Boulder Psychic Institute, which I'm a student at, teaches, they have a whole uh, month training on how to communicate to animals. And I'm considering oh. taking it now um, and seeing what happens. So I'm going to choose really... that one and maybe it'll happen. Okay. <laughs> like what you, about you, Mercedes? I was going to say, uh, like you, I already speak to my cats fluently i know their language they you know talk mine. to yourself a lot exactly so <laughs> what do i need what do i need to do right. more of that for um i definitely Me and my dog talk all the time We're yeah <laughs> we don't even need words we just look at each other no you know exactly um, the closer the better exactly <laughs> so i pick seven languages that's easy for me okay all right what so really last question for you where can people find you on social media interwebs and the like um so i am miss two jits on instagram m-i-s-s the number two and then j-i-t-s and miss two jits on twitter and those are basically the only two platforms that i use so i'm more active on instagram than anything else so just Mm -hmm. check me out there yeah awesome thank you so much for being on the show that was fun yes yeah and of I, course that was so much fun i don't know if i'll ever be in the same place at the same time when it's you know when you're in one of those tropical or spanish-speaking surf locations but my husband's a surfer and he's always trying to get me out there and i'm mostly drowning more than surfing so i would love to learn from you if you have the patience to teach me one day <laughs> do it that would well be awesome. mercedes is going to be out here the week after next to try to promote the show like mm-hmm. we're gonna try to get on a couple podcasts and try to do a couple shoots because we launch on oh, Halloween. No. Um, so oh, she'll be out cool. here. Yeah, the, we're going to yeah, do Kyle's podcast. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll Great. be on it to record that. So yeah. maybe I'll meet. Yay. Yeah. yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. So um, if you just want to hit the stop button and just repeat what you did when you sent him the test, it'll send him all your audio. Okay, cool. Sounds good. If you hit I stop, will... export yeah, his now. wave. Yeah. Thank you so much. And what do you want me to title it? I guess Whitney podcast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm rooting for McGregor tonight, too. So Me we'll too. see what happens. <laughs> Me, too. We just went and placed our bets. And so hopefully we're going to win a lot of money. Nice. Well, he, yeah, he's. I saw he's one and a half to one odds. Oh, yeah. It's last yeah. check. So, yeah. So that <laughs> that's cool. OK, well, enjoy the rest of your Vegas day. All right, you guys have such an awesome day. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Okay.